In this month's economic update, Kaplan Professional Education's Trevor Trahan speaks to an industry economist about the short-term domestic and global economic outlook. Welcome to Kaplan Professional Education's monthly economic update. I'm Trevor Trahan, and this month we're speaking with AMP Capital's Chief Economist, Shane Oliver. Thanks for joining us today, Shane. Pleasure. Thank you. What were the major economic talking points which came out of the 2015 budget? Well, there were several main talking points. The first one is, of course, that in the near term we've seen another hit to government revenue in Australia as a result of low wages growth and the further fall in the iron ore price. Um, so that's why the budget deficit for this year and next is well above what the government was talking about a year ago. Um, on top of that, though, they are still assuming that over time we'll get back to surplus you know, five years down the track or thereabouts. Looks like it's been pushed out basically another year. Um, so that's, that's the bad news in the budget. The good news, though, of course, is that it wasn't as harsh as last year's budget and it's provided a bit of a confidence boost. It's more of a, 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 sort of a, a better feel to it than last year's budget because it lacked the cutbacks that were announced last year. And of course, um, key aspects on that front there were more spending or increased spending on childcare, um, assistance for small business and of course um, some infrastructure for Northern Australia. So there were some goodies in the budget, um, which I think should mean that the budget has a more positive impact on the economy than last year's budget did. Will the budget's small business tax breaks actually boost economic growth? I think uh, in framing this budget, the government obviously uh, was having an eye on the economy as well, which is a good thing to see because last year they largely ignored any economic damage that their budget could do. Um, and so they've announced some measures which I think will help the economy. Interestingly, they've also announced, prior to the budget of course, that they won't be proceeding with the childcare, sorry, the um, paid parental leave scheme. And that of course financed the, the increased spending on childcare and of course the small business uh, tax cut and tax breaks. Um, will those measures help? I think, well, first thing to say is that they're going to get a much bigger bang for the buck from the childcare and the small business initiatives than would have come from the proposed paid parental leave scheme. The second uh, point to note is that the um, small business tax breaks, the uh, incident tax write-off for items up to $20,000, does seem to be having a positive impact on the economy already. All the anecdotes are that uh, lots of people are out there um, Harvey Norman and Officeworks and elsewhere um, buying items for their business. So it seems to be having a bit of a, an impact on the economy. Is it enough to turn the economy around? Time will tell. Um, but I think there's no doubt that it should provide some help. What should have been in the budget that would have produced a bigger or more urgent economic boost to Australia? Well, there could have been a number of initiatives in the budget which might have helped the economy more. You could have cut tax rates uh, to provide more incentive. Um, yeah, you know, more measures to help investment, you know, why, why just small businesses, why not large businesses? Um, the problem with all that though is that I think the government rightly thinks that now is not the time to be undertaking huge fiscal stimulus, that uh, we really need to be trying to get our budget deficit back under control and I think therefore they're, they're right to avoid sort of big ticket spending sort of items in this budget and really rely on the Reserve Bank. Um, to try and fine tune the economy. Why has China just cut interest rates for the third time in six months? The basic problem in China is that monetary policy has been too tight. Interest rates, uh, you know, around 6% last year were, were um, seem lowish, I guess, if you're sort of thinking of economy growing at uh, 7 odd percent. Um, but don't forget that many businesses pay rates which are well above that, more like 10%. And the trouble was, and still is, is that the Chinese economy is still seeing very low inflation. In fact, producer prices are falling to the tune of about 5% a year. So a 10% sort of small business borrowing rate compared to prices falling at 5% per annum, that's actually a 15% real rate. So the real rates of interest businesses were paying were too high. That showed up in a slowdown in Chinese economic growth, made worse, of course, by the property downturn in China. And of course, as a result, the Chinese authorities, the PBOC, their central bank has now recognised that and has been cutting interest rates. And they've probably got more to go. Japan's core inflation picked up for the first time in 10 months in March. How encouraging was that development? Well, I think it's certainly positive to see that uh, core inflation in Japan is back in positive territory. Um, but the trouble is it's only just in positive territory. And um, in the uh, period ahead, um, you really need to see growth continuing to pick up in the Japanese economy. There has been a bit of an improvement over the last six months, 
um, following the negative impact of the sales tax hike a year ago, but we really need to see more evidence that Japanese economic growth is picking up. And as a result of that, that should help maintain price pressures in Japan. So I think Japan's in many ways had the opposite problem to other countries around the world. Historically, you'd always worry about inflation. For Japan over the last 20 years, the issue was deflation. Uh, the trick is to get that nice, neat balance around 2%. And the Japanese are trying to, to change expectations by pumping cash into the economy, pushing down their exchange rate, encouraging companies to pay higher wages to get inflation back to around that 2% level. But of course, it's, uh, it's no easy feat. It can often take uh, many years before they do that, but at least it's heading in the right direction. And it's been a year since Narendra Modi was elected as Prime Minister of India. He promised economic reform and improvement. How do you review his first 12 months in power from an economic perspective? Well, Narendra Modi's victory was taken very positively by global investors and that saw the Indian share market um, put in another good performance as that was factored in. Um, but there does seem to be an element of buy on the rumour there because um, as we now are a year into it, we haven't seen a lot of progress on the reform front. I think they're occurring and there has been some good moves occurring in India in terms of getting the budget on, in, in shape. Um, trying to reduce the reliance on subsidies and open the economy up, um, and also the move to inflation targeting on the part of the central bank. All of those are moves in the right direction, but there's still quite a lot more that needs to be done. And in the meantime, the Indian share market is quite high um, by global standards in terms of valuations. PEs tend to be uh, at the high end. Um, dividend yields at the low end um, and that means that you, you, you could quite easily go through a little period there where the Indian share market remains range bound um, as the reforms gradually catch up with what was factored in by the share market. While bad weather was blamed for the sluggish start to the year in the US, the OECD is now suggesting that wasn't the reason and the US economy is set for a broader slowdown. What's your take? Well my take on the US is firstly that the US economy does seem to have a pattern of having a softer start to the year. If you go back over the last 20 years, the average annualised growth rate in the March quarter has been 1% in the US, but the average annualised growth rate in the two surrounding quarters, the December quarter and the June quarter, has been 3%. Um, so there does seem to be some seasonal adjustment problem there, which understates US growth in the first part of the year, and that may be related to the weather. They're not properly accounting for the impact of, of bad cold weather that America gets at the, through their winter. Um, so that's the first thing to bear in mind. So growth probably will pick up in the current quarter and I think there's enough stimulus in the US economy still with very easy monetary conditions to see growth this year coming around 2.5%. But against that though, it does seem as if we're seeing the same pattern as we've seen over the last five years. That the start of the year, there's optimism, US growth is going to pick up 3% then we get a slow March quarter and as the year proceeds it's clear that US growth is stuck somewhere. Um, around two, two and a half percent, and it looks like that's the case this year. Um, it tells you that uh, the Fed is right to be not in a hurry to, to raise interest rates, um, and there's even a risk that the Fed may delay um, their interest rate hikes into next year. What have the recent figures suggested about the health of the US jobs market? Well, when you look at the US economy, you can sort of debate um, the, the, how strong it is. Um, and it is quite clear that it's not shooting the lights out. This is not a typical uh, recovery from recession we're going through where you sort of go down in a, in a straight line and come up in a straight line. This is not a deep V recovery. Um, against that though, when you look at the US economy, it is clear that it is a lot stronger than it was six years ago at the time of the GFC, the low point of the GFC. The jobs market is reasonably solid. The number of uh, people in employment in the US is well above previous highs, it's at record highs in fact, the unemployment rate at 5.4%, well down on the 10% we saw um, in the aftermath of the GFC, the signs that wages growth is gradually starting to pick up. So when you look at the jobs market in the US, it is quite clear that it is stronger and that's one argument why the Fed is sort of mindful that, that at some point it will have to start raising interest rates, otherwise it could have an inflation problem. Against that though, um, it, it's, it's also clear that things aren't exactly booming. So even though wages growth has picked up, it's only picked up to the, the low point you saw in previous cycles. So it's sort of like half a dozen of this and, and uh, six of that. You know, you, on the one hand, it's looking okay, supportive of US shares and US assets, good for the global economy. On the other hand, it's certainly not shooting the lights out. So you don't want to get too excited about US economy.
So what is a solid rate of growth in the US and when will we see it hit that rate? The trend in the US used to be seen as around about 3%, maybe just a little bit below that. But when you come out of a, a slump, like we saw six years ago, at some point you'd expect to see a run of years, say, where you're running around 4 or 5%. Um, that's the normal cycle of pay it. You have your recession, um, you're well below the trend, around three, and then you have several years well above the trend. We haven't really seen that this time around. Um, we've seen growth stuck for the last four or five years around two and a half percent. So yes, the trend rate has probably come down, um, but there's also an element of Americans being a lot more cautious than they have been in the past for a whole variety of reasons. People just don't want to take on the level of debt that they were happily taking on prior to the GFC, for example. After the election of the Conservative government in the UK, an EU exit referendum will now take place. What will be the various economic arguments from each side in terms of staying or leaving the EU? Well, with the election out of the way, of course, uh, the so-called Brexit issue, whether Britain will stay or exit the EU, is now going to be the focus. Um, that uh, referendum is likely to occur sometime in the next couple of years. I think 2017 is pencilled in for it. Um, thankfully, the Scots are still part of the UK and uh, the Scots are likely to vote overwhelmingly in favour of staying in the EU, which I think will tip the referendum towards a positive, i.e. stay in the EU approach, or at least in terms of the outcome. In terms of the issues um, on the arguments to leave, I guess they come down to a more nationalist approach that the, uh, the British may feel that if they go their own way, then they can tighten up their immigration controls, for example, and get controls over more of the laws they implement. Um, and won't have to finance um, a bureaucracy over there in, in, uh, in Brussels. Um, the flip side, though, is that to leave would mean that they'll, they'll lose access to what is effectively a large, very large common market. Um, and so that may adversely affect European um, trade, but particularly UK exports going to Europe. So UK industry could actually be a loser from that. My personal view is that the UK will actually end up worse off if it does exit the European Union, it would be a, it'd be a big mistake to exit that because they would lock themselves out of what ultimately could prove to be and is proving, I think, over time to be quite successful. Just got to be a traveller in Europe to work out how free it is to move around. Um, if you suddenly uh, put up the barriers again, then that's obviously a return to the past, which would be a negative. The other thing to note in all of this is that a Brexit is not the same as a Grexit. Um, the British are not a member of the Eurozone. And so if they were to leave the EU, it wouldn't have any major financial consequences. In fact, have more negative consequences for the UK, little impact on the rest of Europe. Very different to Greece or Spain or whatever leaving the Eurozone where there would be more financial implications and therefore more potential for market turmoil for that to occur. So just bear in mind that a Brexit is not the same as a Grexit. The economy of the Eurozone grew by 0.4% in the first three months of the year. What do you make of that result? I think the news coming out of Europe recently has been fantastic. We've seen a return to somewhat stronger growth after a soft patch through the latter part of last year where some had started to fear that uh, Europe was heading back into recession again. Um, that seems to have been headed off by a bunch of things, the fall in the euro, um, uh, you know, a, um, I, I guess some stimulus measures, particularly the announcement or the expectation of and then the reality of um, quantitative easing by the European Central Bank. Um, all of those things I think have helped, but the reality is that uh, Europe hasn't fallen off the cliff again and that growth seems to have picked up. And when you look at a whole range of indicators, business conditions indicators, confidence measures, bank lending, they're all pointing in a, in a reasonably favourable direction um, in terms of growth. Doesn't mean Europe's going to shoot the lights out, it's not going to do that, um, but it does mean that we're probably going to continue to leave um, the, the Eurozone crisis of a few years behind us. However, Greece slipped back into recession in the first quarter. What caused that? I think there's a bunch of things going on in Greece and it's, it's very unfortunate this has happened because Greece had made a lot of progress in reforming its economy. It should be up there with Spain, which is one of the, uh, the strongest performers in the Eurozone at the moment. Um, but I think all the turmoil and uncertainty about the Greek election um, has adversely affected confidence. Um, it's certainly affected confidence of those in putting their money in Greek banks because that money's been flowing out. A lot of that money would have been leaving the country. So I, I think the renewed political uncertainty around Greece is having a negative impact weighing on the economy, um, which is unfortunate given all the efforts that, that, and the pain they'd gone through 
in the previous, uh, previous five years or so. Thanks for joining us today, Shane. Okay, my pleasure.